why, why did you come to work at Paramount? Was there some specific reason? Yes, there's a very specific reason. My brother Herman was working there, and outside of my brother Herman, no one in Hollywood had ever heard of me, unless I was been in a position to get me a job. But what is interesting is that you came at the right moment when sound arrived. And I came in with talk. In other words, uh, the studios were busy building sound stages. Uh, because see, the, the actors and actresses, the stars, were either terribly happy or terribly sad because they could or could not speak. I remember when we used to shoot movies, we would start at 5 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, we used the old silent stages, and we hung them with carpets, as many carpets as we could find to keep out traffic noise. And we started shooting because that's when the traffic would go less. And the shooting days went from 5 o'clock in the afternoon to about 4.30 or 5 the following morning. But what was your work in, in uh, particular, what kind of work particularly? Well, I, you to begin with, I was what they called a, a junior writer. Uh, I came out, fortunately, there was a group of uh, Yale Drama School students, the Baker, Baker's Workshop, and uh, the producers were going at this uh, a little bit hysterically, but on the whole rather uh, brightly because they, uh, they went out and said, anybody who writes plays, come out here. We need playwrights and we need young men who are going to be playwrights. And they brought them out. They started schools. You said that each company was different from the other. What was specific about Paramount? Paramount was uh, all young. You have a feeling of youth about Paramount. But where are the men on top different? I mean, the men on top at Paramount different from uh, the, the, the MGM? Uh, Completely different because they served a different purpose. Uh, ben Schulberg was the head of Paramount when I went there, Bert Schulberg's father. Ben had been a publicity man. He was also educated. The level of education was, oddly enough, rather high among the producers. I'm not talking about the very top executives, but men like Walter Wanger, uh, Arthur Hornbow, uh, most of them university graduates, the producers, Bud Lighton, and the head of uh, Paramount, for example, uh, I think Schulberg was the only man who had a political function, which is to keep the bankers in New York off our backs. The power rested with the real, the real owners. Lived, or they were in New York. And each studio was a factory owned by the theaters, not the other way around. And it was the theaters that told them what they wanted. But at the beginning at Paramount, you were writing titles. Was, so what, well, if you think for a moment. Titles for sound films, which yeah, is strange. If you, well, if you think for a moment, there were probably 20,000 cinemas in the United States. Now, sound came overnight. So my job was to take the soundtrack off the sound films that were being made and put subtitles titled them as if they were still silent films. Because for the majority of the Ocean Picture Theatres didn't, couldn't run sound films. Is it true that uh, at Paramount's directors had more freedom than at other companies? Directing a film at that time was, with few, with few exceptions, one of the technical aspects. I can remember having lunch with Lubitsch one day, and I remember I was talking to him about the fact that on Ben Schulberg's desk, the head of Paramount, there was an enormous stack of screenplays. And Ben Schulberg would call in a director and give him one off the top of the stack and say, look, uh, read this right away. If you don't like it, come back, I'll give you the next one. But you start a film Monday. And 
If you ask Suberg, Suberg would say, look, I am supposed to make 90 films a year, which is more than one a week. And I, ha I can't be bothered uh, uh, waiting until every writer and director and uh, supervisor, which is what the producers were called, uh, have everything perfect. I have to have, and I remember Lubitsch saying to me at lunch that day, there's a young man over there who has just received a screenplay, and he starts a week from Monday. Has no time to prepare. I, Lubitsch, I have six months to prepare a screenplay before I shoot it. He said, I think it should be the other way around, don't you? I should be the one that starts in 10 days, and this young man should be given six months. But he said, isn't the way it works. He used to tell me a great deal about uh, how it was. I said to him one day, Ernst, I, I know I've arrived here just after it changed the sound. What was it like? He says, it was fantastic, and you must remember this. You know, he always put his finger around his nose. He says the producers were faced with a sound problem. Talk. They got together the biggest stars and directors and writers that they had. And they said to them, look, you great stars, you great directors, you great writers, unless you stars learn to speak, unless you directors learn to stage dramatically and understand dramatic material, you can't just go out with that box and just shoot whatever you like and put it together. And unless you writers learn to become dramatists, it's finished for you. No matter how big you are, you'll be gone overnight. And Lula says, that's what happened, Joe. As you know, it means that now the great stars disappeared, Polonetri. Great directors, Ince, disappeared, no sound. And many writers. But remember this, every producer made the change successfully. He says, this is where the talent really lies, you see. And this is a very Lubitschian, with the accent on bitch, remark, <laughs> but it's very true. They all made this change successful, the producers. But Sternberg was not the kind of director you would give a script well, to, to yeah, shoot well, on Monday. Sternberg, well, Sternberg, he was a poseur. First of all, he, his guy, he had talent. Sternberg was a superb lighting cameraman. I don't know where he got it, but he was expert with a camera at lighting. When you went to the Von Sternberg set, as you came in, you were supposed to write your name on a blackboard and then wait. The assist one of his assistants would look at your name, would carry it to the master, who would then say, oh, he may come and see me. Also, he conducted. And one of the most bizarre episodes was on Catherine the Great. Scarlet Empress. Scarlet Empress. I came into the studio one morning. This is, this is absolutely true. And I was sent for. We brought to um, the head of the studio, who was then named Emmanuel Cohn. I walked into Emmanuel Cohn's office, and there were Merritt Hulbert, the head of the writing department, four or five executives, producers, and absolutely baffled. And Manico said, Joe, you must help us. We are in a desperate spot. Joseph von Sternberg is supposed to start this very expensive film with Marlene Dietrich called The Scarlet Empress. And he's just put out the screenplay. And nobody can read it. That's what I mean, nobody can read it. It was printed. So yes, but it's printed without any punctuation at all, like the poetry of E. E. Cummings. But no capital letters, no commas, no periods, no full stops, none. And they showed him, and, and really it was unreadable. Because you start and words ran into each other. There was no, no, just nonsense. And the head of the studio, Manny Cohen, said, look, Joe, we know that you know Ron Sternberg. You get along with him, uh, even though I'd never worked for Joe. 
uh, please, because I go to Joe and say, look, do what you can, but get a copy and see if you can't punctuate it for it. <laughs> it's punctuate. Put it in person so that people can read it. And I said, well, I'll try. It sounds like you're going crazy. And he walked into his office. There was a, a blackboard right by the door. And it said, Von Sternberg, Opus, Opus number one, Salvation Hunters. Opus number two, sabotaged by Thalberg. It was that, so you knew you were in the, in the outer office of a megalomaniac. That was for beginners. And I went in to see Joe, and I said, look, Joe, uh, fun is fun. But you cannot put out this fat script with no punctuation. And forgetting uh, everybody else, the prop men have to read this. Our electricians have to read this. Uh, the designers, they've got to know what to do. You must, let me, please, let me punctuate this. I mean, the actors, how are the actors going to learn their lines? And he said, ah. Because now you know. Now you understand. I don't want the actors to learn their lines. The actors must learn their words. I will tell them how to say the lines. He says, you see, Joe, I'm not a fool. But this screenplay, Scarlet Empress, I regard this as my palette. These are my paints. And with these paints, I will paint my picture on the screen. You also worked with another strong character, W.C. Fields. He was a dreadful person. <laughs> but uh, I, I, I had tremendous admiration for him. In a subsequent film called uh, If I Had a Million, an episodic film, I wrote five of the episodes. But I did one in there for... W.C. Fields and um, God, what was it? Allison Skipworth, the Roadhogs. And in, in it, I created a little thing where he says, ah, oh, my little Tom Turtle, oh, my little, oh, my little Sweet Pea, my little bird, my little Robin. We called the woman by different birds' names. And one or two, about a few weeks after the film was out, Bill Fields, W.C. Fields, walked into my office at the studio. And he had under his arms Audubon's birds, every volume of, of birds you can think of for names. And he walked over and he said, son, he says, uh, I, you know, I like that routine you gave me. Well, oh, my little chickadee, my little drum tit. He says, I'd like to buy that from you. I said, well, Bill, you don't have to buy it. This belongs to Paramount, and uh, you can use it. I'm sure you can use it. He said, no, 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 he said, I want it to be my own. I want to own it. And he gave me $50 in cash. He was a bitter man. He was, had, had a bitter childhood. However, he did deliver himself of one remark that I think should be should go down in history. It's probably the most bigoted remark ever made by one person at one time. Uh, Gregory LaCava, this is as the story is reputedly, Gregory LaCava also liked to pull on the sauce, liked to drink a bit. Very drunk, ran into fields one night, and Gregory was extremely happy, Greg was, and said to Fields, have a drink with me, pal, I've just signed a new three-year contract with RKO. And Fields looked at him and said, RKO? You can't work at RKO? Why, that place is run by nothing but Jews. And Lagava was puzzled and said, but Bill, George Schneider, the head of RKO, is a very, very devout Catholic. And Fields looked at him and said, Catholics are the worst kind of Jews. Now, I don't know how you can cram more bigotry into one sentence. But did you follow the shooting of the films you wrote because you thought already of becoming a director? Or? 
No, I, 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 I didn't know. I, I was a writer. Now it ever occurred to me that uh, uh, I was going to direct. And so uh, what happened was the more important my writing got, in other words, the more importance I attached to my writing. And the more, as I grew, as I grew older, I suddenly said, wait a minute, I have things I want to say. And I can say them. Because, again, the formula is your power is equal to your demand. How did, how did Preston Sturgis become the first writer to write and direct a screenplay? He wrote something called Donald Wayne McGinty. Wasn't that the name of it? And Paramount was slavering at the mouth. They wanted it. And he was rich enough and wanted enough to be able to say, you can't have it unless I direct it. Those are the levers that counted. Woody Van Dyke directed most of these things I wrote, and Woody was very quick, and they loved Woody Van Dyke, and Jim did, because he wasn't interested in cutting his own films. Had the slightest interest, whether it was, uh, or the, the Eskimo, or anything. He brought the material back and dumped it. And at five o'clock in the afternoon, Woody Van Dyke would yell, cut, and would stick out his hand, and a glass, a tumbler of gin would be put in that hand by his prop man. This was famous. And I, every now and then, he would force him to go look at the Russians because because Joan Crawford's face was off, half off the screen or something like that. <laughs> and the, the retakes were almost always longer on his films than the shooting. But since you seem to have had a good time and, and freedom at Paramount as a writer, why did you move to MGM when later you became a producer? Metro Goldwyn Mayer was a structured studio. And uh, it was a producer's studio. Later, I was to go to Fox, which was, and Fox was known as a director's studio. Uh, Paramount, where I'd left, was uh, unstructured. Uh, it was a chaotic place, it really was. But when you were at MGM, you were pretty young, 26, and you wanted to become a director. How did Mayer welcome the idea? I had my famous session with Mr. Mayer, which I said, Mr. Mayer, please, I want to direct what I write. This is my goal. And he said, absolutely out of the question, I have great plans for you. Uh, it's pretty well known. He wanted me to succeed Thorberg. And this was the last, the last thing I ever wanted in my life. I'm a, I'd be a miserable executive. I didn't want it. And I said, no. And he said, you're, at least you're going to produce. Because you have a story in mind. I need that sort of producer, I must have, I don't want, anyway, it was the only terms in which I could stay on. He had, he had, but contractually, he had the power to assign me to whatever he wanted to. And uh, he said, right, you'll like producing, because remember, if your goal is directing, you have to learn to crawl before you walk. And I said, that's the best definition of producing I've ever heard, Mr. Mayer crawling before I walk. And he says, you'll find out. And I said, told him, I want to make this picture about the lynching in Northern California. And he listened to the story as I told it. And now, it's been now three years almost since Krasner had told me his play idea. And he looked at me and I said, I think that's a very bad movie. Put it this way, I think you will get very, very good notices from the critics, and it will make absolutely no money. But he said, I want to start you off right as a producer. Make your high-class movie. Go on. Spencer Tracy, you got him. And then I said, well, I, there was a director, Mr. Mayor, who's just leaving contract was up by the name of Fritz Lang. Now, this time, 
Eddie Mannix, the general manager, was in the office. And Mannix said, oh, that, that, that Teutonic son of a bitch, no way, no way. We can, I can't get a crew. I can't get a crew to the war, yo. And you had not made a film yet? Not made a film. In we, America? Well, but the word is I was out. He said, the word is out on this guy. He's a tough, and I know it, Celtic had him on the lot for two years. Nothing happened. Uh, you know, and I said, I want Fritz Lang. He is the director for this movie. And Mayer says, give him Fritz Lang. What was your role as a producer on that film? I guess Fritz worked with uh, Bart Cormack. And when the time came to shoot the film, I let him do the casting. Well, I got Sylvia Sidney. I was responsible. The producer was responsible for the star parts. Because at MGM, the producer was the boss. I remember, he was, he was the boss over the director, who was a very low form of life at MGM. The director's rushes were shown at night to the producer first. And Margaret Booth uh, is a product of that system. This woman who's still, still around mm. and edits films. Uh, then uh, the director was very lucky when he saw all of his rushes all the time at MGM. But at any rate, I wanted Fritz for a very good reason, which was that he had a European style of directing. It was new. I thought it would be just it would be marvelous for that film. And it was. He did a brilliant job. Unfortunately, his personality was such that uh, May, uh, it was impossible for that crew to work with him anymore. Why? Well, he had not learned that American crews are not there to take orders as soldiers. He, had, he carried the sort of uh, the German army approach uh, as, a, as a Kaiser. So he barked out orders and again, uh, it's the sort of thing that Joe von Sternberg later imitated. His complete power of, of life and death that the director had, according to Fritz. Uh, at 12 o'clock, the crew was expected to have lunch call. They'd been working since 8 or 7.30. The of which, Fritz was served by his secretary, and known as the Iron Butterfly by the crew, uh, she'd bring a little salva, a little silver salva with a pill and a little shot of cognac, which he would take in full view of the gas and crew and continue to work. And finally, the crew complained to Spencer one day, Tracy, about lunch. And they said, look, Mr. Tracy, isn't that something you can do? It's almost 2 o'clock. We're hungry. And Tracy said, my, yeah, well, sure. And he called over to Lang and says, by the way, Fred says, we just finished this shot. What about letting the fellows go to lunch? I'd like some lunch, too. And very early on in the movie, Lang said, I will say, when lunch is to be called, Mr. Tracy, nobody else. And Tracy looked at him because, again, he was not of Fritz Lang's school. Tracy looked at him very gently and took his hand and smeared his makeup right off his face. And I looked back at Lang and said, lunch. And walked off the set. A lot of this enraged me. Uh, but we were getting brilliant film. And then suddenly he put into the screenplay uh, episodes that were of an entirely different style of an entirely different uh, standard ghosts who would appear from behind a tree to frighten Tracy after he, uh, he was so he kept well, putting these people in jail, uh, ha ha haunting them, having run for being pursued by ghosts. And this, uh, suddenly when Dr. Caligari came into being again, we were back 20 years in films. But Again, I stuck by him, and we previewed his version of Fury at Glendale. 
and it was laughed off the screen. That is the last two reels. This crazy Disney uh, ghost chase. And when we came out of the preview, Eddie Mannix, the general manager, absolutely white with rage, came up to me and said, look, I'm your friend. I've always been your friend. This is in order. He said, I want you to take that film and cut it so it makes sense, get rid of the, the Walt Disney nonsense. And he says, I want that Teutonic bastard off his set, out of the studio tomorrow morning. And he fired Fritz. And I was given the film to uh, recut. Only that, we moved, and we took it out again, previewed it again, and the result was astonishing. Did Fritz Lang forgive you for the... Fritz Lang did not forgive me. Uh, I think he forgave me later, but I ran into him and Marlena right after the second preview, which was brilliant, was his reception by the audience. And I held out my hand and I said, Fritz, look, uh, we had problems that we got a good movie. And I held out my hand and he said, looked at me and says, you have destroyed my film? I wouldn't shake my hand. However, later on, uh, when I had my troubles with DeMille, which we'll talk about sometime, um, Fritz stood up and uh, very bravely stood up on my side. By that time, we'd learned quite a bit about America. I mean, MGM was a testing ground for Fritz. I mean, you can't go from being the, the absolute ubermensch, the superman, who directed Metropolis and then be expected to respect union laws about lunch? You know. You were a writer and a producer and afterwards you became a director at 20th Century Fox. How did you make the big jump? Well, it was part of my jump from uh, MGM to Fox. It's like leaving one country for another country. Uh, I'd been at MGM for uh, quite a while, almost 10 years. I had a violent argument with Mr. Mayer about a, on a personal subject, really. Uh, but it got, it got out of hand, really. It got to the point where I, uh, in my exuberance, has stated quite, uh, quite seriously that the studio wasn't big enough for both of us and that one of us had to go. So I went. And uh, I went to 20th Century Fox. Daryl Zanuck, again, fortunately for me at the time, he was off liberating Africa with his machine gun. He has uh, movies of himself shooting at German Stuka dive bombers with his machine gun, which he brought back as proof of his, how he repelled invasions. And uh, Joe Skank, I found to be a tremendous help to me. As I say, an honorable and good man who said, I understand you've had a fight with Louis, and that you're coming over here. Of course, we'll give it, I said, I, I want it in my contract that I can direct. And he said, of course you do, and you'll get it. And I had a marvelous contract, which gave me the right to write and direct and produce any of the three or all three at my choice. After Dragon Week, which you wrote, you had three films in a row which you did not write. So why did you stop writing because, three films? Uh, I, I wanted to learn the trade of directing, particularly of directing material that I essentially did not write. Of course, it was a case of a line or two that I did write. And Dragon Week, again, I have a memo here in my papers. Dragon Week had been submitted to me, and I had turned it down as a property. I didn't like it. But then Mr. Lubitsch, who wasn't feeling up to directing, decided to produce. And he picked Dragon Rick as something he wanted to produce. And Ernst asked me whether I would write and direct it. Well, here was my chance to direct my first film under the watchful eye of my teacher, my master, Mr. Lubitsch. So I did my best. I wrote Dragon Rick and directed it. And uh, 
Ernst uh, took his name off the film. I don't know why, because as you saw, I, I have posters with his name on it as producer. I never knew that he had taken his name off it. Uh, whether it's because he was returning to direction or not, I don't know. There are no laws about writing scripts, but did you learn some specific uh, lessons from Lubitsch when, when you worked with him? Well, the lessons you learn from a man like Lubitsch, the lessons you learn about direction, uh, they're not like lessons you learn when you drive an automobile to put in the clutch and then you do this. Um, you, learn, you learn not to do silly things. But I had a scene in which uh, Vincent Price uh, follows his wife into a bedroom. He's furious with her. Now he's the he's the great uh, baron of this of his estate. Very conscious of his position, she throws herself on the bed. She's terribly upset, and he's he's upset. And they have this big fight. And Lubitsch absolutely tore me apart. And he was quite right, because I had left the bedroom door open, right behind him. Well, of course, the first thing he would have done is close that bedroom door. And that would have been good direction. I left it open, which probably most of the audience does not see, or wouldn't. That was bad direction. That sort of thing uh, accumulated in many ways, the little looks. So, of course, those are the things you absorb from a man like Lubitsch when he's functioning as your producer. But as specifically as a writer, in terms of writing a script... Oh, you, know, you don't learn anything from Lubitsch. Don't let anybody tell you that they wrote screenplays for Ernst Lubitsch. They wrote them with Ernst Lubitsch. In other words, you went to Ernst Lubitsch's office and you sat there and you worked your way through the screenplay line by line with Ernst Lubitsch. The direction of a, of a film is either the second half of the screenwriter's job or uh, the writing of a screenplay is the first half of the director's job. Because if it isn't, and the two things occur separately, accomplished by separate individuals, in effect, you have two directors. But a screenplay, properly written, must be written by a writer who... You cannot, you cannot write a screenplay as you write a novel. <coughs> screenplay is much closer to a play, anyway. And we know by now, without going into it, the writing for the speaking actor and writing for the reading person are two completely different disciplines. One is a cerebral thing that do through the eyes and the reader sets his own, listens, listens to his own voice. And the other is through the ears. It's an emotional impact has to have its own rhythm and its own dialogue. This, this, uh, That's why men like Hemingway, Sinclair Lewis, were never able to write plays. It's a different discipline. This would explain for you the, the problems you had with Fitzgerald when you were a producer and, yes. and you, you did not, uh, you rewrote some of his... Well, I had no quarrel with Scott. That was there. That, that to me, the quarrel is all something that happened posthumously. The only thing I can remember about Scott and the dialogue on Three Comrades was being sent for by Margaret Sullivan and Frank Borzaghi because Maggie simply couldn't say the dialogue written for her. And I must say, a lot of it I had thrown out because it was absurd. It was, it was uh, prose. It was not at all dramatic or interesting. So for you, a, a real author-director should at least contribute to the screenplay if he does not write it totally himself. I'm afraid I can't think of a first-rate director who hasn't started from the beginning and worked through the screenplay. 
Now, writing uh, for the screen from the director's viewpoint does not necessarily mean that he has to be able to put the words on paper. But it can be a collaboration of writer and director in which the director is writing during the writing time, and the writer is also directing while he writes, knowing that the director is going to carry that out. It's going to be part of the collaboration, if you will. But why do you want to write all by yourself? Because to me, uh, making a f writing a film is a very personal thing. And I don't think I can do that in collaboration with another writer. I, my, I, my words have to be my words as that character speaks them. Uh, and almost invariably, not almost invariably, but uh, very often in films that I like particularly, there is a character who is me. I, I, I find myself interrupting the, the, the screenplay sometimes by wanting to say something. Uh, and very often I, I, will put, I will put a character in who will be me. George Sanders? In George Eve? Sanders was certainly me. In All About Eve? Yes. Humphrey Bogart in Barefoot Contessa. Yeah. Did you write some of yourself in that oh, character, course. the director? Oh, of course. Great deal. Your, your disillusion about Hollywood? Yeah. Well, not my disillusion about Hollywood. Uh, my awareness of the facts is not necessarily my dis. I was never disillusioned. You Do can't you? fall in with a gang of thieves and be disillusioned about their lack of virginity. That's your. I was never. Oh, not for one minute. I was never illusioned about Hollywood. When you work on a screenplay, how do you? Uh, think in terms of the audience expectations of the character's development or actions. Audience never wants to be in a position of weakness. And that audience rarely wants to know, oh, but rarely wants to be in a position of not knowing more about characters than the characters themselves know. On the other hand, the process of fooling an audience is, is the basis of good character, drama. There are some directors who prefer the, the writing stage, others the directing stage, and others the editing stage. Do you like all three periods as much? or I enjoy the directing. I enjoy being able to work with, get the best out of other creative people. I think I'm a good director of actors. I think I work equally well with men and with women. And I enjoy the discovery of a good performance. It's a plot, really. It's a conspiracy. The actors, the text, and the director to get the most out of that text. Because directing and acting are interpretive arts. They are not creative arts. Oh, you can argue that there is a creativity in getting the most out of an actor. But that's like saying Toscanini is being creative. Uh, and the creativity in Toscanini get the, getting the most out of an orchestra. But yet David Selznick will say, Toscanini is the producer. David O. Selznick said, the producer is the most important part of the film, which is why he fired, why he always broke the director's credit. And I'm about to tell you an allegory. And the allegory is called, What Does a Producer Do? This is what you wanted to know. This is what the, the dinner partner always says. Yes, I know what you do. I know what an actor does. But what does a producer do? And I always answer with this allegory, which is that a producer, a writer, and a director are lost on the Mojave Desert. They're looking for location hopelessly lost. They don't know where they are. And they finally say, well, look, this is silly. We're just going to wander around, blunder into, our, into death. Why don't we each follow our separate talents and see if we can find our way out of this mess we're in? And 
they decide to do that. And the writer, stumbling along, sees a rock. And he has a feeling. And he pushes this rock aside. And there is an enormous tin of tomato juice, untouched by the sand and the heat, cool under that rock. And he stares at this tin of tomato juice and he says, I, the writer, have discovered the basic substance from which we shall live. And holds it up. And the director with blurred wrist comes over and sees this and says, yes! And gets out his knife and says that I, the director, will make this available, will open it up so that we can partake of this substance. And with his last remaining bit of strength, the director pries open this tin of tomato juice. And they're about to drink when the producer staggers up with his last bit of strength, says, wait, first I, the producer, must piss in it. <laughs> And that, dear children, is what the producer basically does. He pisses in the tomato juice. Now, uh, there are some who do not. There are some who provide the tomato juice. There are some who provide the providers of the tomato juice. But that was the basic understanding at the time. I began in films. I've seen very little reason, particularly today, because today, uh, all sorts of things come out from under rocks, including producers. I suppose that when you do your first film, the, the, the role of the cameraman must be quite important for a fresh director who has never been on, on, on a set or has never had some problems to, to solve. So how, what was your experience on, on, on Dragon Week? Well, I think I told you before that I literally uh, ran out of work first afternoon and uh, I said hand me the finder and this wonderful cameraman I had handed me the finder and I literally I have to admit it because it's, it's a standard joke by now I looked through the round end which is the wrong end of the finder you're supposed to, you're supposed to look through the Rectangular end, and um, I couldn't see anything. And it was, I turned to Arthur Miller, John Ford's cameraman. And Artie Miller said, look, why don't you just set this scene up as you would? Just set it up with the actors and play it the way you want to play it. And then call me over and say, Artie, what do you think? And I'll suggest, I'll, I'll come up with some kind of a suggestion. Or might be something you never thought of. You know, in this case, all you have to do is say, that's just what I had in mind. And you're in. Don't worry about it. He said, but he said, don't become one of those young directors who says, give me the finder, and says, mark me here, mark me here, mark me there. Because you know what you're doing? You're destroying your cameraman. He says, I've worked with every great director in the business, this side of the border and overseas. I have all of their experience I picked up. It's all at your disposal. Why not take advantage of it? And this, I think, is almost the most important lesson I ever learned from anybody. But you exclude the bizarre outfits for your camera because you don't like to have visible movements of the camera in your films. The most perfect film, seems to me the perfect film, would be the film that keeps the audience riveted from start to finish in what is happening, participating in it, without knowing that it's ever been directed. But the moment the director stops the proceedings and calls attention to himself by a fake, phony, 
uh, sorry, the wizardry of his uh, camera techniques. This, to me, is uh, an interruption in the dramatic flow, certainly an interruption of dramatic conflict, and certainly interposing himself between the audience and what he wants the audience to be involved with. There is an old saying in Hollywood that you are as good as your last movie, and your latest movie was Sleuth, made 10 years ago, which was a big commercial and critical success, and nevertheless you have not done anything in the last 10 years, so can you tell us why? Well, actually, I've, well, I think I've probably been called upon to... I've broken all the Hollywood rules, uh, starting with when I was a junior writer. So all, my first Academy Award nomination was... 1931, and over 50 years, 52 years ago, my last nomination was the last film I did. And uh, if you want a bit of trivia, there's only one film in history, and there will never be another film like it, I wouldn't do wager, in which the entire cast is nominated for Best Performance. I made that film. It was the last film I made. Sleuth, the entire cast, was nominated for Best Male Performance, and I don't think that will ever be equal. All About Eve has the record for, still for the most nominations of any film. And I'm now setting a record for the most number of years going by without making a film. Uh, following um, my Academy nomination. For some reason or other, I, I mean, it's, as you say, it's a violation of the You're As Good As Your Last Film. Uh, you suppose they've come to the conclusion that I'm too good to work? You know, uh, at any rate, I'm ready, willing, and able. I just haven't found anything. Uh, I don't want to remake films I wouldn't have wanted to make 30 years ago, uh, which they are doing. I really have very little interest in intergalactic warfare. I don't like directing robots. Uh, I found myself, I guess I was sort of taken with E.T., but I found him very ugly, and I wouldn't want to direct him. If something good comes along, worth making, but I would enjoy making, and audiences would enjoy seeing and hearing if audiences once more can be conditioned to listen to a, the screen as well as look at it, which is very unlikely. I want to work. I want to work very much. In the meantime, I am working on a history of the performing woman, in particular, particularly the English actress, how women came to play women in the theater. And I've got a couple of plays that might become plays. And for the rest, I have an awful lot to read that I haven't read, and I'll die happily. Uh, Unhappy only because I haven't read more than I have read and found out more about the thing I love most in the whole world, which is the theater, the theater in which we live, the theater which we project on film, and the theater which we present in, on the stage, and the theater of everyday life, which is the conflicts and the interrelationships of men and women who make intelligible noises and don't grunt. <laughs> Outside of that, I can have very little to offer. Wonderful. Can you stand and leave the chair, please? Very okay, what? Yeah. What was that? That was a wonderful answer. Wonderful answer. Oh, I didn't know it. I don't know.